رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل العقدم من لسانی یفقہ قولی پروردگار میرا سینہ کھول دے اور میرے کام کو میرے لیے آسان فرما دے اور میری زبان کی گرہ سلجھا دے تاکہ لوگ میری بات سمجھ سکیں بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈینٹس ہاؤ آر یو آل آئی ہوپ یو آل آر ڈوئنگ ویری ویل آئی ایم مس وزیا الطاف اینڈ ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ لیکچر نمبر فائیو فرام دا چیپٹر نمبر ففٹین ڈیٹ از اباؤٹ ہومیوسٹیسس فرام یور گریٹ ٹویلتھ بایولوجی بفور اسٹارٹنگ دا لیسن لیٹ شیئر دا کوٹیشن فار ٹوڈے ایٹ اینی گیون مومنٹ یو ہیو دا پاور ٹو سی This is not how the story is going to end. So it is your will how you are going to end your story. So always uh, be ambitious and uh, the only thing I always motivate my students who have a willpower. Never lose your willpower. Always say, okay, I can do this. I will do this. Uh, so uh, today we are going to discuss about the dialysis and the mechanism uh, behind uh, this procedure and how uh, dialysis is done uh, by artificial uh, means and uh, what kind of procedures are done and how many different types of dialysis uh, are available. So we are going to uh, discuss all the things that are related to dialysis. Dialysis, uh, we have actually uh, studied in the yesterday's class that uh, dialysis is done uh, when a patient is suffering from a chronic uh, renal failure. And uh, in case of acute renal failure, also sometimes dialysis is needed if it uh, prolongs for a longer time period. So first of all, we are going to discuss about the dialysis mechanism. So basically, it is a procedure to filter the toxins from the blood by artificial methods when the kidneys are unable to perform its normal function. So uh, this is also known as renal dialysis because it is related to the renal function of the body. So basically the working principle is exactly uh, similar uh, to the kidneys. Although it is not as effective or efficient as the natural processes performed by the kidneys, but still it is helpful, to, uh, helpful for the body so that the body uh, can get rid of the nitrogenous waste by artificial means. So it uh, helps and uh, it helps effectively, but not as effective as the kidney functions. So there are uh, two general types of renal dialysis. Uh, number one is the hemodialysis and the second one is known as the peritoneal dialysis. Now, uh, now as you can see over here, uh, hemo means blood and hemodialysis actually requires the blood uh, filtration through a machine. While in case of peritoneal dialysis, uh, there is a cavity inside the abdominal region of a human and uh, by utilizing that cavity and the membranes that surround that cavity that are known as perit uh, peritoneum, uh, the fluid is actually filled in the peritoneum cavity and uh, we, are, we are going to actually see the whole procedure how this uh, peritoneal dialysis is performed. So these are the two general types of renal dialysis that are uh, practically performed uh, in, on, in clinics and uh, these uh, pro procedures can be done at home also under uh, proper hygienic conditions. So first of all, uh, we will see about the hemodialysis and hemodialysis uh, basically means uh, cleaning the blood. Now, when we uh, say cleaning the blood, uh, what does it uh, mean? It means uh, uh, cleaning the blood uh, by removing the nitrogenous waste from the body. So let's see what is the mechanism that is behind the hemodialysis that is used. So basically uh, blood is circulated through a machine. That machine is known as dialyzer. Dialyzer is also known as artificial kidney and uh, uh, 
blood is circulated through a machine actually outside the body and uh, this machine that is known as dialyzer actually removes the waste and water from the uh, blood and ultimately blood uh, gets rid of all the nitrogenous waste along with that excess water is also removed. So the dialyzer is basically is a kidney machine and it consists of a tubes with semi permeable membranes and uh, that actually work on the same principle as the kidney for the removal of nitrogenous waste and excess water from the blood. Now let's see the procedure. So in this procedure, basically a catheter is actually inserted into the blood vessel, usually in the arm area or sometimes in the uh, near the neck region is also inserted. So it routes the blood circulation externally through the machine. This is a dialyzer machine. Uh, so that the blood can uh, get rid of all the toxins and excess water. And uh, after the cleaning of blood, the cleansed blood uh, then returns to the body through a second catheter into a vein. Blood is uh, taken out from an artery, arterial, uh, arterial blood is actually taken out from the artery and it is returned back, the clean blood is returned back to the veins of the body. So in case of long-term hemodialysis, a permanent uh, arteriovenous shunt is actually uh, connected to an artery and a vein so that the damage can be prevented to the uh, blood vessels. So the dialysis machine uh, uh, has a cannula that is uh, connected to the shunt that is uh, uh, surgically inserted into the arteries and veins and whenever hemodialysis is desired the uh, dialysis machine cannula is connected to that shunt so here you can see a blood pump what is the purpose purpose of this pump over here the dialysis machine consists of a pump and a container along with that in which a network of synthetic tubes okay this is a container in which a, a network of synthetic tubes are present and these are mostly made up of uh, cellophane membranes and uh, this is known as a dialyzer and uh, basically these membranes, uh, these tubes are actually responsible for removing the uh, nitrogenous uh, waste from the blood in the presence of a fluid. That fluid is known as dialysate fluid. So uh, dialysate is actually uh, poured into the machine uh, from the bottom and it is released out from uh, towards uh, the upper region and uh, the blood is input from the top and it is removed from the uh, lower part of the machine and it is returned back to the body. Here a uh, clot and bubble trap is also uh, located so that uh, the, if there is a, a clot that is present in the blood or if a bubble is appeared it can be trapped over here and a blood uh, that is reaching the body is danger free. So uh, after uh, circulating the blood through a membranous tube, uh, the blood leaves the machine from the top and uh, actually uh, leaves the machine and returns back to the body. So basically what is the purpose of this fluid that is known as dialysate? Basically dialysate attracts a certain substances like uh, minerals, electrolytes and uh, some other nitrogenous uh, waste byproducts. Uh, so it attracts uh, all these waste products from the blood and the, these materials from the blood are escaped out from these membranes into the fluid that is the dialysate and the dialysate has the capacity to absorb these substances and uh, once it absorbs the nitrogenous substances it is moved out from the machine and new fluid is inserted and this is actually a continuous process. So this is the basically mechanism of the tubes in the dialyzer. Uh, these are the semi-permeable membranes. So the blood with waste products uh, is inserted at, in the tube and the dialysate is uh, located in, uh, in the outer uh, surfaces of these tubes. And because of this, dialysate has the capacity to attract the nitrogenous waste, minerals and uh, electrolytes. It will uh, selectively uh, uh, diffuse out the uh, nitrogenous phase from the blood and ultimately the clean blood is returned back to the body. This was all about the procedure behind the hemodialysis. 
Now let's see what are the advantages of hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is basically better as compared to the peritoneal dialysis because of the uh, permeability issues, uh, because uh, different individuals have a different permeability. Uh, it is actually variable from person to person. So uh, the hemodialysis is actually more preferred by doctors as compared to the peritoneal dialysis and some doctors believe that the peritoneal dialysis is less effective as compared to the hemodialysis at clearing the toxins from the body. What the kind of toxins we are talking about? We are talking about uh, nitrogenous uh, toxins uh, that are not required by the body. So the second uh, comes the peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is basically, it works on the same principle as the hemodialysis, except that here no machine is required. Abdominal cavity is used. Abdomen actually has a uh, cavity that is known as peritoneal cavity. That is actually lined up by a thin epithelium. That epithelium is known as peritoneum. So basically peritoneum encloses the whole abdominal cavity and uh, here you can see the procedure. Uh, let's see the procedure of uh, peritoneal dialysis. Basically a catheter is insert, surgically inserted in the abdominal, uh, abdominal cavity of a patient that actually serves as a portal uh, through which the dialysate fluid is uh, uh, entered into the body and it actually leaves the cavity after uh, absorbing the nitrogenous waste and uh, it is drained out uh, in a second drainage bag. So the molecules of dialysates are uh, too large so that they are not passed through the peritoneum. Where does the peritoneum, that is a thin epithelium lies? This is abdominal cavity that is known as peritoneum cavity. It is surrounded by a thin membrane that is known as peritoneum. So basically, uh, whenever the blood capillaries that are associated or that are uh, um, running along with that uh, peritoneum, uh, membrane, uh, the blood vessels will going to diffuse out the waste products uh, into the uh, dialysate and the dialysate is going to absorb those uh, uh, minerals and extra electrolytes from the blood and uh, ultimately uh, dialysate uh, that is now uh, actually that has absorbed all these waste products is going to uh, uh, remove from by the help of second catheter that carries the dialysate out of the abdominal cavity and it is collected into another bag that is known as drainage bag. So here you can see uh, this is the mechanism uh, movement or this is the peritoneum uh, membrane and that is surrounded by blood capillaries. Uh, this uh, cavity is filled with the dialysate and as soon as the cavity is filled with the dialysate all the nitrogenous waste and electrolytes and minerals are uh, passed out from these uh, blood capillaries into the dialysate and ultimately dialysate is uh, removed out from the body and in this way uh, body can get rid of nitrogenous waste. Now why peritoneal dialysis is not uh, much favorable as compared to hemodialysis because the permeability of these uh, vessels actually varies uh, from patient to patient. So it is uh, not as effective as compared to the hemodialysis. So now we will uh, study about the kidney transplant and the procedures and the problems that are faced regarding the transplantation process. So let's see what is a kidney transplant and uh, how it is done. So the basic principle behind the kidney transplant is that uh, it is a surgical process uh, of replacing a fully functional kidney from a donor into a patient that is suffering from a uh, chronic kidney failure. So, and uh, kidney graft, uh, actually this process uh, is also known as the grafting. So the kidney graft is taken uh, from a deceased donor or it can be a life uh, that can be your relative or uh, some unrelated person can also uh, donate the kidney if uh, situations are met, that is the uh, ABO blood comp uh, compatibility should be matched and uh, secondly, histocompatibility tests are matched. So ABO blood system uh, compatibility is essential between the donor and recipient. First of all, blood is matched and after that, uh, 
uh, donor kidney is actually selected on the basis of leukocyte antigen matching. It is uh, known as HLA. So leukocyte antigen matching is done and uh, uh, why it is selected on this basis uh, as the, it improves the graft survival inside the recipient's body. Who is the recipient? The person who is receiving the uh, functional kidney or a patient. So a person can live normally with just one kidney. So uh, you only uh, one kidney is usually working in our body. And uh, just uh, uh, imagine that how beautifully Allah has already created an extra kidney in your body. In case if one gets harmed, the other one can actually overcome the situations and it can become functional uh, when it is required. So uh, this is how uh, the kidney is transplanted and uh, here you can see the kidney is actually transplanted to, uh, to a new location, not on the exact location, it is transplanted near to the bladder. So basically uh, a surgical process is required to graft a donor kidney to a patient and uh, old kidneys are removed only if they cause uh, infection or uh, it is uh, causing high blood pressure in a body of a patient. In this case, uh, old kidneys are removed. Uh, sometimes both kidneys are removed because uh, both kidneys uh, become uh, unfunctional in case of chronic uh, renal failure. And uh, if uh, a removal of one kidney is enough, uh, it is uh, removed from the body and uh, these blood vessels are actually sealed up uh, from here and a new kidney is placed in the lower abdominal region near the bladder. This is a urinary bladder and it is attached to a large artery that is known as the femoral artery that is actually responsible for supplying the blood to the uh, lower limbs. So basically these parts are actually taken from the donor and this uh, ureter is also uh, the grafted one that is taken up uh, from the uh, donor. Now, uh, did you know Dr. Adib Rizvi is a pioneer in treating the kidney related diseases in Pakistan and he started off very humbly by just a ward in a civil hospital, Karachi, where he treated kidney patients and this is a real story. Uh, this doctor actually literally uh, uh, transplanted kidneys uh, free of charge. And uh, this eight bedded uh, ward was established in 1971 and today it has grown into a fully fledged uh, institu uh, institution that is called uh, Sind Institute of Ur uh, Urology and Transplantation that is known as SUIT. And Dr. Adib Rizvi is a recipient of many awards uh, locally and internationally and treatment at uh, SIUT is totally free of cost. So when a person uh, do some uh, good deeds in uh, that favor of the community, Allah is there to reward you. Now let's see what are the problems that are associated along with the kidney transplant. Basically uh, two major problems are faced. Number one is the rejection and second one is the toxic effect of cyclos uh, cyclosporine. Basically uh, these problems are usually treated by adding the extra doses of steroids and uh, we all know that steroids are the chemical substances that are not uh, uh, good for the body. But this has to be taken, otherwise uh, the tissue rejection or organ rejection will be, uh, might be experienced by your body. So the patients are required, uh, second uh, toxic effect of cyclosporin is, uh, has to be bared by the patient uh, because the cyclosporins are the medicines that are used to suppress the immune system in order to prevent uh, rejection of an organ. Now remember one thing, if at any point recipient stops taking these medicines, uh, the rejection can occur even after 10 or 15 years of the transplantation. So these medicines are the life, uh, they act as a lifesavers for the uh, recipient's body. 
so uh, describe the importance of the kidney donation for the benefit of kidney failure patient so the kidney donation donation is relatively a safe option and uh, we can actually save a person uh, from a suffering of a long term pain of uh, hemodialysis and uh, many donors will never feel the loss of their second kidney and it is quite normal uh, only you have to go through a surgical process and after that you will experience a normal life so it's the most uh, expendable of uh, organ so giving up a kidney causes no disadvantage to your long term health in fact studies have shown that kidney donors actually live longer than the general population because donors come from a pool of people in a good health so just think people have no problem having only one kidney so we have to ask why uh, did allah uh, give us two kidneys perhaps it is so you would have an extra one to donate and save a life might be this is the reason that allah has uh, uh, given an extra kidney to your body so it is just a thought and it is shared in your book also now comes the favorite topic of thermoregulation why it is favorite because uh, we are uh, very much sensitive towards the temperature actually we girls are very sensitive is it or not when we are in the kitchen and uh, we are like okay it's so hot and then we uh, move into the room that has an air condition and we experience a certain temperature change from hot to a cold environment and just imagine how much work our body has to do in that situation so what is a thermoregulation basically let's uh, see a definition the maintenance of internal body temperature within a tolerable range with respect to the changing external environment that allows the uh, cells of your body to function efficiently so this procedure or this uh, mechanism is known as thermoregulation so the body works to balance the amount of heat loss to maintain the stable internal temperature of the body and the temperature change if exceeds the opt optimum range of enzymes so we have studied in uh, first year uh, in first year we are uh, we studied about the optimum range uh, temperature range of enzymes and uh, we know that if uh, the temperature is changed uh, above the optimum uh, range of an enzyme uh, the enzyme may become denatured and how it may uh, change the shape of the active sites and it causes the metabolic reaction to completely stop so uh, temperature regulation is very 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 important uh, for the normal metabolic uh, uh, activities to occur inside the body so uh, now this is an important topic and uh, some of the things are skipped in your new book but i uh, studied them in detail and uh, i thought it must be shared with you in detail so the classification of animals on the basis of temperature is done how we can classify uh, animals on the basis on uh, a factor that is temperature so basically uh, previously it um, uh animals can be classified into two ways basically uh first one is the classification on the basis of response of animals to the variation in the environmental uh, temperature and this is the old classification actually uh i'm going to share the reason why it is not favored nowadays secondly classification on the basis of the source of heat production or a metabolic heat and this is a new classification system and it is more favored as compared to the old classification system so let's see the first uh, one and that is a classification on the basis of response of animals uh to the variation in the environmental temperature so basically on this basis animals can be classified as uh, uh, poikilotherms so poikilotherms are basically they are unable to maintain their body temperatures within the narrow limits using their physiological mechanism so in short we can say they are unable to maintain their uh, or regulate their body temperature and the examples include all the invertebrate species amphibians and reptiles later on it was uh, studied that uh, it is not true to say that all the invertebrates or fishes are uh, unable to regulate their body temperature some of them are able to regulate so this is a reason uh, why uh, this classification system was not favored and secondly we can classify them as uh, homeotherms homeotherms are the ones uh, that are able to maintain a fairly constant body temperature by using the physio uh, physiological mechanisms of the body 
and it includes uh, birds and mammals and uh, now let's see what are the drawbacks of this classification and what are kind of objections were on the old classification system deep sea fishes actually they have they can maintain their body temperature due to the constant natural surroundings because they live in a certain uh, habitat they don't uh, move towards the shallow waters towards the shallow waters or the upper levels of the oceans so they don't actually experience the temperature change so this is known as the behavior uh, behavioral uh, thermoregulation also uh, so uh, behaviorally they are actually on a same level so they uh, mean they can maintain our uh, body temperature uh, due to the constant natural surroundings secondly the lizards are are able to regulate their body temperature according to the environment and uh, that is why reptiles can are uh, not uh, be classified as uh, all the reptiles cannot be classified as uh, uh, equilotherms and uh, in case of hemotherms uh, we have said that all the birds and mammals uh, are hemotherms but actually this is not the case uh, the bird like hummingbird and the mammal like bats are uh, able to vary their body uh, vary their body temperatures according to their surrounding environment so they do not have the uh, regulatory mechanisms as compared to the other mammals of the uh, other mammals now the second one is the classification on the basis of the source of heat production this is actually a very much favored uh, mode of classification that is accepted uh, by the scientific community and heat production is actually also known as metabolic heat that is uh, produced as a result of uh, by product as a result uh, by product is produced uh, as a result of metabolic reactions so animals are uh, of three types on the basis of heat production source uh, number one is the endotherms what are endotherms basically they are able to generate their own body heat as a by product during the metabolic reactions that are occurring in their muscles or by the action of hormones hormones are actually responsible to increase the metabolic rate uh, depending upon the situations actually and it includes all the birds some fishes flying insects and mammals so uh, this includes the flying insects also along with the mammals ectotherms is the second uh, uh, class and ectotherms are basically they produce the metabolic heat at a very low level and that is also uh, exchanged quickly <coughs> sorry uh, that is also exchanged quickly with the environment and uh, it absorbs heat from their surroundings <coughs> so they has a capacity to absorb heat from the surroundings and let's see what kind of uh, animals are included in this uh, the most invertebrate species amphibians and reptiles are ectotherms and number third is the uh, heterotherms heterotherms are the organisms that are capable of varying degrees of endothermic heat production but generally they do not regulate their body temperature within a narrow range so this includes uh, bats and hummingbirds etc now let's see the thermoregulatory strategies in the case of human so we are going to discuss about the thermostat function and feed feedback control in um, feedback control mechanisms in human so the human body temperature is regulated by a complex hemostatic uh, systems in the body and uh, that are also helped by the feedback mechanisms so we have actually a thermostat in our body what is a thermostat thermostat is uh, actually responsible to control the temperature of a system uh, to a set point so the regulatory center for the body temperature is located in the brain and uh, in a part of the brain that is known as hypothalamus and it is also uh, it also acts as a thermostat and it maintains the body temperature in a normal range so what is a set point of the body temperature it uh, has a range between 36.1 degrees celsius to a 37.8 celsius so the receptors in the skin can also detect a temperature change of the surrounding environment also and uh, most of the time uh, like uh, in summers we do not uh, like to wear a uh, warmer cloth so uh, 
whenever we are going to wear a warm clothes uh, our body will going to make uh, the physiological changes and uh, we will have a lot of sweating and uh, the uh, condition so that uh, we will feel to get rid of those clothes and uh, wear something uh, lighter. So uh, behavioral responses are also helped to correct the situation without the need of any physio uh, physiological responses sometimes and uh, uh, the behavior of a human also helps to uh, control the temperature of their body also. Like if I'm experiencing uh, a hotter temperature i'm going to switch on the fan or a ac and similarly if i'm feeling cold i'm going to switch off all these things and in case of winters i'm going to use some heating systems so that uh, the external environment uh, can be um, bearable by the body so what happens when the body temperature is above normal the situation is known as hyperthermia when the temperature of the body is higher so the physiological responses uh, to hypothermia that is uh, uh, experienced by the body is basically basically hypothalamus sends the signals uh, to the system of the body to increase the blood flow to the skin that is known as vasodilation blood vessels are dilated and blood flow increases in this case more heat can be escaped from the skin sweat gland activation is done and uh, more sweating actually causes the evaporation of heat uh, to evaporation and it uh, gives you the cooling effect and uh, when the body temperature is below normal the situation is known as hypothermia and uh, what happens basically the temperature that is below the 37 uh, uh, degrees celsius actually it is uh, lower than 36 the cold receptors actually send uh, impulses to the hypothalamus to inhibit the heat loss mechanisms and activate the heat conservation mechanisms to uh, it makes the body to conserve the body heat. So the physiological responses that are experienced uh, uh, during hypothermia conditions are constriction of superficial blood vessels. This is known as vessel constriction so that uh, heat escape can be prevented. It stimulates the shivering and non-shivering thermogenesis mechanism as uh, the shivering of the muscles actually uh, causes a heat production. Now let's see if uh, we are uh, going some uh, we are going to some hilly areas and uh, uh, that area has a colder environment. What kind of physiological uh, changes will be experienced by our body? First of all, uh, spas uh, spasmodic contraction of muscles. Shivering will produce heat to the uh, produce heat so that uh, it is going to help raise the body temperature. Secondly, vasoconstriction uh, reduces the blood flow to the skin and in this way the heat that is uh, present in the blood is uh, uh, prevented uh, to get uh, actually it uh, prevents to uh, the loss of a uh, heat. So uh, the third is the piloerection. Piloerection is basically the erection of skin hair and it traps the air uh, in uh, between the hair and it acts as an insulator and uh, it provides some insulating effect and it reduces the sensation of cold. And uh, fourth point is that the increased metabolic rate and uh, during winters the metabolic rate of the body increases and we can actually utilize this for our weight loss programs also by eating a good uh, healthy food. Now this is a flow chart and this one is important uh, whenever you are going to attempt the question that is related to the thermal regulation you are going to draw this uh, flow chart along with your answer. So the thermal regulatory center is present in the brain that is the hypothalamus and uh, the different pathway is that uh, first of all we are going to see if the balance is upset. What is uh, upset? Uh, the body heat has uh, increased, the body temperature rises. So when body temperature rises, the temperature sensitive cells in skin and brain are going to actually receive the stimulus and they are going to give the signal to the brain and brain is going to generate a response. In a response, factors are activated and uh, sweat glands, for example, evaporation will be done, vasodilation will be done. As a result, the temperature will set back to the normal. And the second thing is that if uh, the body temperature falls, the receptors are again going to 
receive the signals or uh, signals are given to the brain as a result skeletal muscles will become activated shivering will be experienced and uh, uh, vasoconstriction will be experienced uh, and uh, the physiological changes are going to maintain the body temperature and the body uh, temperature of the body rises and uh, when it uh, reaches a set point it uh, the response that was generated it ends and uh, body remains at a normal uh, conditions So that's all for today. I hope you really enjoyed the lesson and this makes the completion of the chapter 15 and that was about homeostasis. We have completed all the five lectures and all the five lectures are available in the playlist. You can uh, check uh, in the channel also. And uh, if you have any question related to this chapter or related to, today's, to, to the today's lesson, you can ask in the comment section below. Inshallah, I'm going to reply your all uh, queries over there. Thank you so much for your time. Take uh, very good care of yourself, of your parents, of your friends and siblings. Uh, try to make everyone happy uh, and uh, by your uh, good uh, conduct. And... Uh, Try to do everything every day something uh, new, creative, and that is uh, good for the well being of others, also. So, uh, try to do some kind of good deed every day and remember that uh, uh, before going to the bed. And uh, this is all for the lesson number 15, chapter number 15 of your biology. And inshallah, from tomorrow, we are going to start the next lesson. Till that time, take care and Allah Hafiz.